It was almost 6.30 when I got home. The rumble was set for 7, so I was late for supper, as usual. I always come in late. I forget what time it is. Jerry had cooked dinner, baked chicken and potatoes and corn. Two chickens because all three of us eat like horses, especially Jerry. But although I loved baked chicken, I could hardly swallow any. I swallowed five aspirins, though, when Jerry and Soda weren't looking. I do that all the time because I can't sleep very well at night. Jerry thinks I'd just take one, but usually I take four. I figured five would keep me going through the rumble and maybe get rid of my headache. Then I hurried to take a shower and change clothes. Me and Soda and Jerry always get spruced up before a rumble. And besides, we wanted to show those socias we weren't trash, that we were just as good as they were. Soda, I called from the bathroom. When did you start shaving? When I was 15, he yelled back. When did Derry? When he was 13. Why? You figuring on growing a beard for the rumble? You're funny. We ought to send you into the Reader's Digest. I hear they pay a lot for funny things. Soda laughed and went right on playing poker with Steve in the living room. Derry had on a tight black t-shirt that showed every muscle in his chest and even the flat hard muscles of his stomach. I'd hate to be the soda who takes a crack at him, I thought, as I pulled on a clean t-shirt and a fresh pair of jeans. I wish my t-shirt was tighter. I have a pretty good build for my size, but I'd lost a lot of weight in Windricksville, and it just didn't fit right. It was a chilly night, and t-shirts aren't the warmest clothes in the world, but nobody ever gets cold in a rumble, and besides, jackets interfere with your swinging ability. Soda and Steve and I had put on more hair oil than was necessary, but we wanted to show that we were greasers. Tonight, we could be proud of it. Greasers may not have much, but they have a rep, that and long hair. What kind of world is it where all I have to be proud of is a reputation for being a hood and greasy hair? I don't want to be a hood, but even if I don't steal things and mug people and get boozed up, I'm marked lousy. Why should I be proud of it? Why should I even pretend to be proud of it? Jerry never went in for the long hair. His was short and clean all the time. I sat in the armchair in the living room waiting for the rest of the outfit to show up. But of course, tonight the only one coming would be 2-Bit. Johnny and Dallas wouldn't show. Steven and Soda were playing cards and arguing, as usual. Soda was keeping up a steady stream of wisecracks and clowning, and Steve had turned up the radio so loud that it almost broke my eardrums. Of course, everybody listens to it loud like that, but it just wasn't the best thing for a headache. You like fo- fights, don't you, Soda? I asked suddenly. Yeah, sure, he shrugged. I like fights. How come? I don't know, he looked at me puzzled. It's action, it's a contest, like a drag race or a dance or something. Shoot, said Steve. I want to beat those socials' heads in. When I get in a fight, I want to stomp the other guy good. I like it too. How come you like fights, Jerry? I asked, looking up at him as he stood behind me, leaning in the kitchen doorway. He gave me one of those looks that hide what he's thinking, but Soda piped up. He likes to show off his muscles. I'm going to show him off on you, little buddy, if you get any mouthier. I digested what Soda had said. It was the truth. Jerry liked anything that took strength like weightlifting or playing football or roofing houses, even if he was proud of being smart too. Jerry never said anything about it, but I knew he liked fights. I fell out of things. I'll fight anyone anytime, but I don't like to. I don't know if you ought to be in the rumble, pony, Jerry said slowly. Oh no, I thought in mortal fear, I've got to be in it. Right then, the most important thing in my life was helping us whip the socias. Don't let him make me stay home now. I've got to be in it. How come? I've always come through before, ain't I? Yeah. Jerry said with a proud grin. You fight real good for a kid your size, but you were in shape before. You've lost weight and you don't look so great, kid. Your teeth tensed up too much. Shoot, said Soda, trying to get the ace out of his shoe without Steve seeing him. Where he get all tensed up before a rumble. Let him fight tonight. Skin never hurt anyone. No weapons, no danger. I'll be okay, I pleaded. I'll get hold of a little one, okay? Well, Johnny won't be there this time. Johnny and I sometimes ganged up on one big guy. But then Curly Shepherd won't be there either, or Dally, and we'll need every man we can get. What happened to Shepard? I asked, remembering Tim Shepard's kid brother, Curly, who was a tough, cool, hard-as-nails Tim in miniature, and I had once played chicken by holding our cigarette ends against each other's fingers. We had stood there, clenching our teeth and grimacing, with sweat pouring down our faces and the smell of burning flesh making us sick, each refusing to holler, and Tim happened to stroll by. When he saw we were really burning holes in each other, he cracked our heads together, swearing to kill us both if we ever pulled a stunt like that again. I still have the scar on my forefinger. Curly was an average downtown hood, tough and not real bright, but I liked him. He could take anything. He's in the cooler, Steve said, kicking the ace out of Soda's shoe, in the reformatory. Again, I thought, and said, let me fight, dearie. If it was blades or jeans or something, it would be different. Nobody ever really gets hurt in a skin rumble. Well, Jerry gave in, I guess you can, but be careful, and if you get in a jam, holler and I'll get you out. 
I'll be okay, I said wearily. How come you never worry about Soda Pop as much? I don't see you lecturing him. Man, Derry grinned and put his arm across Soda's shoulders. This kid is, this is one kid brother I don't have to worry about. Soda punched him in the ribs affectionately. This kiddo can use his head. Soda Pop looked down at me with mock superiority, but Derry went on. You can see he uses it for one thing, to grow hair on. He ducked Soda's swing and took off for the door. Two-Bit stuck his head in the door just as Derry went flying out of it. Leaping as he went off the steps, Derry turned a somersault in midair, hit the ground, and bounced up before Soda could catch him. Welp, Two-Bit said cheerfully, cocking an eyebrow, I see we're in prime condition for a rumble. Is everybody happy? Yeah, screamed Soda, as he too did a flying somersault off the steps. He flicked up, flipped up to walk on his hands, and then did a no-hand cartwheel across the yard to beat Derry's performance. The excitement was catching. Screeching like an Indian, Steve went running across the lawn in flying leaps, stopped suddenly, and flipped backward. We can all do acrobatics because Derry had taken a course at the Y and then spent a whole summer teaching us everything he'd learned on the grounds, that it might come in handy in a fight. It did, but it also got two bit and soda jailed once. They were doing mid-air flips down a downtown sidewalk, walking on their hands and otherwise disturbing the public and the police. Leave it to those two to pull something like that. With a happy whoop, I did a no-hands cartwheel off the porch step, hit the ground, and rolled to my feet. Two-Bit followed me in a similar manner. I am a greaser, Soda Pop chanted. I am a JD and a hood. I blacken the name of our fair city. I beat up people. I rob gas stations. I am a menace to society. Man, do I have fun. Greaser, 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 Steve sing-songed. Oh, victim of environment, underprivileged, rotten, no-count hood. Juvenile delinquent, you're no good, Derry shouted. Get thee hence, white trash, Tubit said in a snobbish voice. I am a soche. I am the privileged and the well-dressed. I throw beer blasts, drive fancy cars, break windows at fancy parties. And what do you do for fun? I inquired in a serious, odd voice. I jump greasers, Tubit screamed, and did a cartwheel. We settled down as we walked to the lot. Tubit was the only one wearing a jacket. He had a couple cans of beer stuffed in it. He always gets high before a rumble. Before anything else, too, come to think of it. I shook my head. I'd hate to see the day when I had to get my nerves from a can. I'd tried drinking before once. The t- stuff tasted awful. I got sick, had a headache, and when Derry found out, he grounded me for two weeks. But that was the last time I'd ever drink. I'd seen too much of what drinking did for you at Johnny's house. Hey, two-bit, I said, deciding to complete my survey. How come you like to fight? He looked at me as if I was off my nut. Shoot, everybody fights. If everybody jumped in the Arkansas River, old two-bit would be right on their heels. I had it then. Soda fought for fun, Steve for hatred, Derry for pride, and Two-Bit for conformity. Why do I fight, I thought, and I couldn't think of any real good reason. There isn't any real good reason except for self-defense. Listen, Soda, you and Pony Boy, Derry said as we strode down the street. If the fuzz show, you two beat it out of there. The rest of us can only get jailed. You two can get sent to a boy's home. Nobody in this neighborhood is going to call the fuzz, Steve said grimly. They know what would happen if they did. All the same, you two blow at the first sign of trouble, you hear me? You sure don't need an amplifier, Soda said, and stuck his tongue out at the back of Jerry's head. I stifled a giggle. If you want to see something funny, it's a tough hood sticking his tongue out at his big brother. Tim Shepard and company were already waiting when we arrived at the vacant lot, along with a gang from Brumley, one of the suburbs. Tim was a lean, cat-like 18-year-old who looked like the model JD you see in movies and magazines. He had the right curly black hair, smoldering dark eyes, and a long scar from temple to chin, where a tramp had belted him with a bo- broken pop bottle. He had a tough, hard look to him, and his nose had been broken twice. Like Dally's, his smile was grim and bitter. He was one of those who enjoyed being a hood. The rest of his bunch were the same way. The boys from Brumley, too. Young hoods who would grow up to be old hoods. I'd never thought about it before, but they just get worse as they got older, not better. I looked at Derry. He wasn't going to be any hood when he got old. He was going to get somewhere. Living the way we do would only make him more determined to get somewhere. That's why he is better than the rest of us, I thought. He's going somewhere. And I was going to be like him. I wasn't going to live in a lousy neighborhood all my life. Tim had the tense, hungry look of an alley cat. That's why he's always reminded me of an alley cat. And he was constantly restless. His boys ranged from 15 to 19, hard-looking characters who were used to the strict discipline Tim gave out. That was the difference between his gang and ours. They had a leader and were organized. We were just buddies who stuck together. Each man was his own leader. Maybe that was why we could whip them. Tim and the leader of the Brumley outfit moved forward to shake hands with each of us, proving that our gangs were on the same side in this fight, although the most of the guys in the two outfits weren't exactly what I'd like to call my friends. When Tim got me to me, he studied me. 
maybe remembering how his kid brother and I had played chicken. You and the quiet, black-headed kid were the ones who killed that soche? Yeah, I said, pretending to be proud of it. Then I shot a thought of Cherry and Randy and got a sick feeling in my stomach. Good going, kid. Curly always said you was a good kid. Curly's in the reformatory for the next six months. Tim grew, grinned ruefully, probably thinking of his roughneck, hard-headed brother. He got caught breaking into a liquor store. The little... He went on to call Curly every unprintable name under the sun. In Tim's way of thinking, terms of affection. I surveyed the scene with pride. I was the youngest one there. Even Curly, if he had been there, had turned 15, so he was older than me. I could tell Derry realized this too, and although he was proud, I also knew he was worried. Shoot, I thought, I'll fight so good this time he won't ever worry about me again. I'll show him that someone besides po Soda Pop can use his head. One of the Brumley guys waved me over. We mostly stuck with our own outfit, so I was a little leery of going over to him, but I shrugged. He asked to borrow a weed, then lit up. That big guy with y'all, you know him pretty well? I ought to, he's my brother, I said. I couldn't honestly say yes. I knew Derry as well as he knew me, and that isn't saying a whole lot. No kidding. I had got a feeling he's going to be asked to start the fireworks around here. He's a pretty good bopper. He meant rumbler. Those Brumley boys have weird vocabularies. I doubt if half of them can read a newspaper or spell much more than their names, and it comes out in their speech. I mean, you take a guy that calls a rumble a bop action, and you can tell he isn't real educated. Yep, I said, but why him? He shrugged. Why anybody else? I looked our outfits over. Most greasers didn't have real tough builds or anything. They're mostly lean and kind of panther-looking in a slouchy way. This is partly because they don't eat much and partly because they're slouchy. Derry looked like he could whip anyone there. I think most of the guys were nervous because of the no weapons rule. I didn't know about the Brumley boys, but I knew Shepherd's gang were used to fighting with anything they could get their hands on. Bicycle chains, blades, pop bottles, pieces of pipe, pool sticks, even sometimes heaters. I mean guns. I have kind of a lousy vocabulary too, even if I am educated. Our gang never went in for weapons. We're just not that rough. The only weapons we ever used were knives, and shoot, we carried them mostly for looks. Like 2-Bit with his black-handled switch. None of us had ever really hurt anybody or wanted to. Just Johnny, and he hadn't wanted to. Hey, Curtis, Tim yelled. I jumped. Which one? I heard Soda yell back. The big one. Come over here. The guy from Brumley looked at me. What'd I tell you? I watched Jerry going toward Tim and the leader of the Brumley boys. He shouldn't be here, I thought suddenly. I shouldn't be here, and Steve shouldn't be here, and Soda shouldn't be here, and 2-Bit shouldn't be here. We're greasers, but not hoods, and we don't belong with this future, bunch of future convicts. We could end light up like them, I thought. We could, and the thought didn't help my headache. I went to stand with Soda and Steve and Tubit then, because the Soshas were arriving, right on time. They came in four carloads and filed out silently. I counted 22 of them. There were 20 of us, so I figured the odds were as even as we could get them. Derry always liked to take on two at a time anyway. They looked like they were cut from the same piece of cloth clean-shaven with semi-beetle haircuts, wearing striped or checkered shirts with light red or tan-colored jackets and madras ski jackets. They could just as easily have been going to the movies as to a rumble. That's why people don't ever think to blame the Soshas and are always ready to jump on us. We look hoodie and they look decent. It could be just the other way around. Half of the hoods I know are pretty decent guys underneath all that grease, and from what I've heard, a lot of Soshas are just cold-blooded mean, but people usually go by looks. They lined up silently, facing us, and we lined up facing them. I looked for Randy, but didn't see him. I hope he, he wasn't there. A guy with a moderate strip stepped up. Let's get the rules straight. Nothing but our fists and the first to run lose, right? Tip, Tim flipped away his beer can. You savvy real good. There was an uneasy silence. Who was going to start? Derry solved the problem. He stepped forward under the circle of light made by the street lamp. For a minute, everything looked unreal, like a scene out of a JD movie or something. Then Derry said, I'll take on anyone. He stood there, tall, broad-shouldered, his muscles taut under his t-shirt, and his eyes glittering like ice. For a second, it looked like there wasn't anyone brave enough to take him on. Then there was a slight stir in the faceless mob of Soshas, and a husky blonde guy stepped forward. He looked at Derry quietly, said, Hello, Daryl. Something flickered behind Derry's eyes, and then there were ice again. Hello, Paul. I heard Soda give kind of a squeak, and I realized the blonde was Paul Holden. He had been the best halfback on Derry's football team in high school, and he and Derry used to buddy it around all the time. He must be a junior in college by now, I thought. He was looking at Derry with an expression I couldn't quite place, but disliked. Contempt? Pity? Hate? All three? Why? Because Derry was standing there representing all of us, and maybe Paul felt only contempt and pity and hate for greasers? 
Jerry hadn't moved a muscle or changed expression, but you could see he hated Paul now. It wasn't only jealousy. Jerry had a right to be jealous. He was ashamed to be on our side, ashamed to be seen with the Brumley boys, Shepherd's gang, maybe even us. Nobody realized it but me and Soda, and it didn't matter to anyone but me and Soda. That's stupid, I thought swiftly. They've both come here to fight, and they're both supposed to be smarter than that. What difference does the side make? Then Paul said, I'll take you, and something like a smile crossed Jerry's face. I knew Jerry thought he could take Paul any time, but that was two or three years ago. What if Paul was better now? I swallowed. Neither one of my brothers had ever been beaten in a fight, but I wasn't exactly itching for someone to break the record. They moved in a circle under the streetlight, counterclockwise, eyeing each other, sizing each other up, maybe remembering old faults and wondering if they were still there. The rest of us waited with mounting tension. I was reminded of Jack London's book, you know, where the wolf pack waits in silence for one or two members to go down in a fight. But it was different here. The moment, moment either one swung a punch, the rumble would be on. The silence grew heavier, and I could hear the harsh, heavy breathing of the boys around me. Still, Derry and the Soch walked slowly in a circle. Even I could feel their hatred. They used to be buddies, I thought. They used to be friends, and now they hate each other because one has to work for a living, and the other comes from the west side. They shouldn't hate each other. I don't hate the Soches anymore. They shouldn't hate... Hold up, a familiar voice yelled. Hold it. Derry turned to see who it was, and Paul swung. A hard right to the jaw that would have felled anyone but Derry. The rumble was on. Dallas Winston ran to join us. I couldn't find a Soch my size, so I took the next best size and jumped on him. Dallas was right beside me, already on top of someone. I thought you were in the hospital, I yelled as the Soch knocked me to the ground and I rolled to avoid getting kicked. I was. Dally was having a hard time because his left arm was still in bad shape. I ain't now. How? I managed to ask as the Soch I was fighting leaped on me and we rolled near Dally. Talked the nurse into it with two-bit switch. Don't you know a rumble ain't a rumble unless I'm in it? I couldn't answer because the Soch, who was heavier than I took him for, had me pinned and was slugging the sense out of me. I thought dizzily he was going to knock some of my teeth loose or break my nose or something, and I knew I didn't have a chance. But Derry was keeping an eye out for me. He caught that guy by the shoulder and half-lifted him up before knocking him three feet with a sledgehammer blow. I decided it would be fair for me to help Dally, since he could only use one arm. They were slugging it out, but Dallas was getting the worst of it, so I jumped on his Soch's back, pulling his hair and pounding him. He reached back and caught me by the neck and threw me over his head to the ground. Tim Shepard, who was fighting two at one, accidentally stepped on me, knocking my breath out. I was up again as soon as I got my wind and jumped right back on the Soch, trying my best to strangle him. While he was prying my fingers loose, Dally knocked him backward so that all three of us rolled on the ground, gasping, cussing, and punching. Somebody kicked me hard in the ribs, and I yelped in spite of myself. Some so had knocked out one of our bunch and was kicking me as hard as he could. But I had both arms wrapped around the other Soch's neck and refused to let go. Dally was slugging him, and I hung on desperately, although the other Soch was kicking me, and you'd better believe it hurt. Finally, he kicked me in the head so hard it stunned me, and I lay limp, trying to clear my mind and keep from blacking out. I could hear the racket, but only dimly through the buzzing in my ears. Numerous bruises along my back and on my face were throbbing, but I felt detached from the pain as if it wasn't really me feeling it. They're running, I heard a voice yell gleefully. Look at the dirty blank run. It seemed to me that the voice belonged to Tubit, but I couldn't be sure. I tried to sit up and saw that the Soches were getting into their cars and leaving. Tim Shepard was swearing blue and green because his nose was broken again, and the leader of the Brumley boys were working over one of his own men because he had broken the rules and used a piece of pipe in the fighting. Steve lay doubled up and groaning about 10 feet from me. We found out later he had three broken ribs. Soda Pop was beside him, talking in a low, steady voice. I did a double take when I saw Tubit. Blood was streaming down one side of his face, and one hand was busted wide open. But he was grinning happily because the Soches were running. We won, Derry announced in a tired voice. He was going to have a black eye, and there was a cut across his forehead. We beat the Soches. Derry stood beside me quietly for a minute, trying to grasp the fact that we had really beaten the Soches. Then, grabbing my shirt, he hauled me to my feet. Come on, he half-dragged me down the street. We're going to see Johnny. I tried to run but stumbled, and Dally impatiently shoved me along. Hurry, he was getting worse when I left. He wants to see you. I don't know how Dallas could travel so fast and hard after being knocked around and having his sore arm hurt some more, but I tried to keep up with him. Track wasn't ever like the running I did that night. I was still dizzy and had only a dim realization of where I was going and why. Dally had Buck Merrill's T-Bird parked in front of our house, and we hopped into it. I sat tight as Dally roared the car down the street. 
We were on 10th when a siren came on behind us and I saw the reflection of the red light flashing in the windshield. Look sick, Dally commanded. I'll say I'm taking you to the hospital, which will be truth enough. I leaned against the cold glass of the window and tried to look sick, which wasn't too hard, feeling the way I did right then. The policeman looked disgusted. All right, buddy, where's the fire? The kid, Dally jerked a thumb toward me. He fell over on his motorcycle and I'm taking him to the hospital. I groaned and it wasn't all fake out. I guess I looked pretty bad too, being cut and bruised the way I was. The fuzz changed his tone. Is he real bad? Do you need an escort? How would I know if he's bad or not? I ain't no doc. And yeah, we could use an escort. As the policeman got back into his car, I heard Dally hiss, sucker. With the siren ahead of us, we made record time getting to the hospital. All the way there, Dally kept talking and talking about something, but I was too busy to, dizzy to make sense of most of it. I was crazy. You know that kid? Crazy for wanting Johnny to stay out of trouble, for not wanting him to get hard. If he'd been like me, he'd never be in this mess. If he got smart like me, he'd never run into that church. That's what you get for helping people. Editorials in the paper and a lot of trouble. You'd better wise up, pony. You get tough like me and you don't get hurt. You look out for yourself and nothing can touch you. He said a lot more stuff, but I didn't get it all. I had a stupid feeling that Dally was out of his mind, the way he kept raving on and on, because Dallas never talked like that, but I think now I would have understood if I hadn't been sick at the time. The cop left us at the hospital as Dally pretended to help me out of the car. The minute the cop was gone, Dally let go of me so quick I almost fell. Hurry. We ran through the lobby and crowded past people into the elevator. Several people yelled at us, I think because we were pretty racked up looking. But Dally had nothing on his mind except Johnny, and I was too mixed up to know anything but that I had to follow Dally. When we finally got to da Johnny's room, the doctor stopped us. I'm sorry, boys, but he's dying. We gotta see him, Dally said, and he flicked out two-bit switchblade. His voice was shaking. We're gonna see him, and if you give me any static, you'll end up on your own operating table. The doctor didn't bat an eye. You can see him, but it's because you're his friends, not because of that knife. Dally looked at him for a second, then put the knife back in his pocket. We both went into Johnny's room, standing there for a second, getting our breath back in heavy gulps. It was awful quiet. It was scary quiet. I looked at Johnny. He was very still, and for a moment I thought in agony, he's dead already, we're too late. Dally swallowed, wiping the sweat off his upper lip. Johnny cake, he asked in a hoarse voice. Johnny? Johnny stirred weakly, then opened his eyes. Hey, he managed softly. We won, Dally panted. We beat the Soches. We stomped them, chased them out of our territory. Johnny didn't even try to grin at him. Useless. Fighting's no good. He was awful white. Dally licked his lips nervously. They're still writing editorials about you in the paper for being a hero and all. He was talking too fast and too calmly. Yeah, they're calling you a hero now and heroizing all the greasers. We're real proud of you, buddy. Johnny's eyes glowed. Dally was proud of him. That was all Johnny had ever wanted. Pony boy. I barely heard him. I came closer and leaned over to hear what he was going to say. Stay gold, pony boy. Stay gold. The pillow seemed to sink a little, and Johnny died. You read about people looking peacefully asleep when they're dead, but they don't. Johnny just looked dead, like a candle with the flame gone. I tried to say something, but I couldn't make a sound. Dally swallowed and reached over to push Johnny's hair back. Never could keep that hair back. That's what you get for trying to help people, you little punk. That's what you get. Whirling suddenly, he slammed back against the wall. His face contracted in agony and sweat streamed down his face. Damn it, Johnny, he begged, slamming one fist against the wall, hammering it to make it obey his will. Oh, damn it, Johnny, don't die. Please don't die. He suddenly bolted through the door and down the hall.